And I pray, Lord, for anyone in here that's discouraged or whatever, you know, any, anything that someone is going through, that you would help them through the trials and that you would encourage us this morning, Lord, that we'd keep our eyes on you because we know that you are the light of the world. And we thank you for coming to this world to die on the cross for our sins so we could have eternal life. And we lift you up, Lord Jesus, and we exalt you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as I was mentioning before in uh, the book of John, the gospel of John is a different gospel as compared to the um, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, which you, you see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that the life of Jesus from beginning covers his birth, his life, and his death, burial, and resurrection. And then, of course, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's three witnesses because in order for a truth to be established in a court, court of law, you had to have a minimum of two and at least two to three witnesses. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke. So the book of John is different. It's not like the synoptics, and they already cover that, that part of it being the, the three witnesses, but in the book of John, John is trying to prove a point like in a court of law, as I mentioned before. And so he brings up, um, there's seven sayings, the I am statements, and of course we see Jesus said that I am the light of the world, that's one of the I am statements. He said before Abraham was, I am, and that is the, the title Yahweh, I am, the self-existent one, Jehovah the God of eternity, past, present, and future. So Jesus has the, the seven I am statements, and then he also brings up seven witnesses, and this is one of them right here, that witness to Jesus being the Messiah. This is the sixth witness. And then you also have the, um, the seven miracles or the sign miracles that proves that Jesus is the Messiah. Like he turned the water into wine, the healing of the nobleman's son, and of course, giving sight to the blind. So John is bringing up these, these miracles for a particular reason. There's a lot of things that Jesus has done. In fact, it even says in the book of John that if the works of, of Jesus were listed in the, in the Bible, or if, if all the works of Jesus were listed, the world itself could not contain the books that was written because there's so many things that Jesus has done. But these things he put in here that you would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you will have life because of believing and trusting in him. You have life through his name. And so Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We talked about what that meant, the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. He is God. And um, we know that John proves that point all the way through. So in this in this chapter we see the healing of the blind man now chapter 8 ended with the jewish leaders wanting to stone jesus because of what he was saying that he was saying that he is god and so they wanted they wanted to stone him they wanted to kill him so jesus hid himself and left the temple and we know that they just celebrated the uh, feast of tabernacles they just finished celebrating that they were dismantling the um the huge torches there are four huge torches that they were taking apart at this time. And so they just celebrated that, and Jesus just said that he is the light of the world. And now we're going to see that he is going to give sight to someone who's blind. So as Jesus was leaving the temple area, he comes across a blind man who was um, begging. And Jesus, as he stated that he is the light of the world, and he, that, he said this, this, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now he meets up with a man who has only known darkness his entire life. So this isn't just someone who's blind. This is someone who was born blind. This is someone who never saw before. And this entire chapter illustrates the light of the world in action. Jesus Christ is the light of the world as he reaches into the darkness of one man's life, opens his eyes, and sets him free. Truth is light. And whenever someone receives Jesus, they receive the light of the truth. And as a result, they become free. As Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. So now we, we begin. 
The first thing is the man, the man that's born blind. Verse 1 through 4. So verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So it's interesting that the disciples, instead of wanting to help him, they just wanted to know, why is he born? What, what, what happened that he's born this way? What, did his parents sin? And we know that in those days, there was a, um, a lot of you know, sicknesses and there's sexually transmitted diseases that caused blindness. We, we even know that in, in our day. And so they're saying, was it his parents' sin or something that they did that he was born blind? Or is it that he sinned? Which is kind of interesting because they're asking, did this man sin that he was born blind? Which, of course, implies that he sinned in his mother's womb. And there was some people that believed in, you know, all kind of strange things. And like in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says that in, uh, concerning Jacob and Esau, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. So some, there was a, a belief that some Jews had that someone could sin in their mother's womb like um, Esau did, as where the Bible says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Of course, it's not talking about hate like what we're thinking of. It just means the Edomites were passed over for Jacob and the Israelites or the children of Israel, that it's going to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But they took that to mean something, and so then they asked that question. Did, did he sin? But it's interesting that they were concerned about debating this, the reason for his blindness rather than having compassion and wanting to help the person. Sometimes that's what religion does. It just tries to solve uh, uh, debates People are wanting to debate while those that are struggling need help, and no one is there to really help them. And we see that the religious Jews, when the Bible here, when it talks about the Jews, it's referring to the, the religious Jews, that they were not really, it didn't seem that they really cared about helping people. They just wanted to be right. And so the disciples, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're discussing the cause for the, for the um, blind man's condition. But rather, they, sh they needed to have compassion. It says in Jude 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference. If we're going to make a difference in people's life, we have to have compassion. Compassion is, is being able to see someone in a difficult situation and put yourself in their place. How would you like it if you were there? How would you want someone to to treat you if you were in that situation? Or what if that was your son or your daughter or your, or your mother or your father? So we see that in the story of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, verse 33 through 34, it says, A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, the man that was beaten half dead, he had compassion on him. But we know that the priests and the Levites saw him, and what did, he, what did, what did they do? They passed by on the other side. It's like, ooh. I got, and I, I have something to do. I have, I have uh, places to go, people to meet. I'm busy. Besides, the, the people that beat him up, they might be right around the corner. So I'm not going to risk that. And for whatever reasons and however they rationalize it, they just pass by on the other side. But the good Samaritan, he had compassion. And that's the reason why he ended up helping him. Now, the good Samaritan, I'm sure he had places to go. I'm sure he had um, people to meet. I'm sure that, you know, he thought about the fact that the, the people that beat up this guy could be right around the corner. He had the same excuses, but why did he help? Because he had compassion. And that's what we need to have. We need to have compassion. Of course, that's what Jesus says. He said, go and do thou likewise when he tells the story about the Good Samaritan. Verse 3, Jesus answered when they asked the question, who did this sin, this, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. He says, neither. It wasn't this man. This man didn't sin, and his parents didn't sin. I mean, obviously they sinned, but that wasn't the reason why he was born blind. And Jesus says something really interesting. 
but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, that people would be able to see God work. That's why this man was born blind. And you're thinking, man, wow. This guy was born blind so that people could see God work? Now, we live in a world that is a cursed world. A lot of times people ask the question, why does God let um, bad things happen to good people? And then you, then you can ask yourself, well, what's, what is a, a good person? <laughs> We're all sinners. But when Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered into this, in, into this world, and the Bible says death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And so we live in a cursed world. And living in a cursed world, there's sin, there's death, there's problems. In fact, we know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation is under a, cor a curse. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. We're waiting for the curse to be lifted. And one day it will be, we'll be in the millennial kingdom. Until then, we lived in a world that is under a curse. And you and I sense it and feel it every day. And we know that one day we're going to, you know, we're going to die. We're going to get old and die, or we're going to die young. And either way, people question it, but that's just what's going to happen. We live in a cursed world. And if you study the Bible, when God told Adam and Eve, well, he told Adam, actually, in the day that you eat thereof of the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. Death means separation. You will surely die. And then we, we see that, that Eve ate the fruit, and then she gave it to Adam. He ate the fruit. And then we see in chapter 5 that Adam died. In fact, chapter 5 of Genesis is the death chapter. And we see all the patriarchs and all the, the progenitors and, and uh, those that uh, lived first, they, they all died. And God promised, and that's what happened. So we know that we live in a cursed world. So this man's, but this man's blindness particularly was in the plan of God that the works of God would be revealed in him. And in verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus is about, he, he is busy about doing his father's business. And he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. He is the light of the world. And he says, while it is day, I must do the works of my heavenly father. Because we only have a limited amount of time. And we ought, we ought to take serious that verse. The night cometh when no man can work. There's going to come a day where we can no longer uh, be a witness. There's going to come a day where we can't do discipleship anymore. When we get to heaven, everyone's going to, they're already going to be uh, Christians and they're already going to have the, the understanding. But right now, while we are on this earth, we can disciple. We can go to prayer meetings. We can worship the Lord in church. We can get involved with ministry. And we can only do it now. There's going to come a day where we can no longer do that. So we see the man that's born blind. And Jesus, of course, he already said that he is the light of the world. Now, this is a guy that has only known darkness all of his life. So Jesus saw the blind man as an opportunity to work the works of God. And Jesus sensed an urgency to do this before it's too late. He says in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he already said that, that he is the light of the world. So we see the man, the man that was born blind. Then the next thing we see is the method, the method of the healing. This is kind of interesting. It says in verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So here's Jesus, he spits on the ground, and then he makes clay out of the, the dirt, and then he anoints the person's eyes with that. <laughs> what would you have thought if you were the, the blind man? 
So Jesus uses an unusual method for healing. He made clay out of his spit. Now we can suppose that Jesus wanted to emphasize at least two things. Just as God used the dust of the ground and clay to do a work of creation in Genesis as Adam was formed out of the the dust of the ground and and God um, formed him out of the clay, here Jesus is doing an act of creation. Remember, this guy is never... He has never been able to see. So it's almost as if Jesus is creating and putting within him these eyes that can see. He's never saw before. Another thing, Jesus found it important to change his methods of healing. If you notice that Jesus had, uh, he had healed other people before of blindness, and he did it different ways. I mean, Jesus could just speak the word and the person can see. But in this instance, and then you... You also have the instance where the guy, where, where the, um, he was given his sight kind of in, uh, in intervals. Where well, first he saw people as trees walking. He just kind of saw like shadows. So Jesus found it important to change his methods of healing so that no one could ever make a formula for the, for the uh, methods of his healing. Because sometimes people do that. Now, I just was talking about this in, uh, I'm teaching Acts class in a Bible college up the road. And... In the book of Acts, it's interesting how people receive the Holy Spirit at the beginning because the book of Acts is a transitionary book. So in the book of Acts, you see on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers. And that's the first time that that happened to believers because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was given to believers for for a, a certain periods of time, for certain situations on certain people like the king, King David, he talked about that. And, uh, but it, he didn't stay with them permanently. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to reside on the believers. And that's the first time that that had happened. So now the, those that were already believers, Jesus told them to tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, on the day of Pentecost, which Pentecost means 50th, on that day, which was the, uh, one of the seven feasts of Israel, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And they received the Holy Spirit. So now you got people today that will preach this tarrying. you got to tarry. But they had to tarry because Acts is a transitionary book. And then you see the outline in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit, or it says in Acts 1.8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, which that's the same region, So you have uh, that area of Judea where Jerusalem was, and then in Samaria, and then unto the uttermost part of the earth. So you see that there was a transitionary element of the church that needed to expand. And first it starts off in Jerusalem, and then there's going to be, it's going to expand to Samaria, and then it's going to expand to the uttermost part of the earth. But you know that in Judea and in Samaria, there were a lot of uh, uh, they had a lot of prejudices that the Samaritans and the um, Jews, they despised each other, right? So here you have the church in Jerusalem. And the church at Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers there. And so now the next step is Samaria. So then God sends Philip to Samaria. And he preaches the, the gospel. And they get saved. And then what? The Holy Spirit comes down upon them. And, um, but before the, the Holy Spirit comes on upon them, after, they re- after he preaches the message, they got saved, they received the message. What happened? They said, wait a minute. We got to send for the apostles to come from Jerusalem to lay hands on them. And the reason why the, the, um, the apostles had to lay hands on them was so that what was happening in Samaria would be connected to what was happening in Jerusalem. Because you couldn't, otherwise you'd have two rival churches. You couldn't have two rival churches, right? So then it had to connect. What is happening in Samaria had to connect with what is happening in, in Jerusalem. And so God sent the apostles. So Peter and John, they went there and they laid hands on them. When they laid hands on them, then the Holy Spirit came down. But that's different from Jerusalem, right? Nobody laid hands on anybody. But in Samaria, they laid hands on them, and then the Holy Spirit came down upon them. So now you got people that lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we see that 
The same thing had to happen with Cornelius, who's not a Jew. So you had the Jews receive the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans, they received the Holy Spirit. Someone had to lay hands on them. And then you had Cornelius, when Peter went there, that the Holy Spirit just came down upon them. And of course, all of these instances, we see that they spoke with tongues. In Jerusalem, it doesn't say it in Samaria, but we assume something happened because Simon knew, hey, well, I, I wish I could do this, and he wanted to pay money to, for that power. And then in Cornelius, the Holy Spirit came down, and then you had, you had everything linked together to Jerusalem. And so then you had one more situation where the Old Testament saints also had to receive the, the Holy Spirit. And if you remember that in Acts chapter 19, so in, in, at Pentecost, then in Acts chapter 8, in Samaria, and in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, he wasn't a Jew, and then in Acts chapter 19, Old Testament saints. That's the only time that people spoke with tongues, and that's the only time we see about the Holy Spirit coming down upon believers, and people have taken those instances as a pattern to how someone receives the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is not to be taken as a pattern. The book of Acts is a transitionary book. There's a transition between the old covenant to the new covenant. So you got to be real careful. And that's why there's a lot of confusion. But the book of Acts, there's a transition. And there's only one place in the Bible that tells you what tongues is for. It says tongues are for a sign to them which believe not. Unbelieving Israel, that judgment is coming because they rejected the Messiah. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. But what I'm saying is, you have to be careful sometimes about when you see something in the Bible that you're going to pattern yourself after it. And, of course, we see it in this story here, too. You can just see a, a whole denomination, you know, healing people with spit and dirt. <laughs> now, we might laugh, but there are some interesting things that come out of some of the things that you read, you see in the Bible. You know, with the healing of the, the handkerchiefs and people selling handkerchiefs that have been prayed over, and if you get it, you'll be healed, and they take that from certain things in the Bible where there is a transition going on in the book of Acts. So now when you get saved today, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus Christ one time. And the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So anyway, why Jesus did it this way, we don't know all the reasons. It could have just been a very practical that Jesus wanted him to go to the pool of Siloam. So he spit on the ground. He made clay, anointed his eyes with it, and says, go wash. And, of course, he's going to want to wash it off, right? So he, he, it could have just been that Jesus wanted to get him to, to act upon what he said. Now, Jesus didn't say that if you do this, you're going you're gonna to have your sight restored. He just told him to go to the pool of Siloam, and that the interpretation of Siloam means sent. He sent him to the pool of Siloam to wash. That's, that's all it said. And he obeyed him and went. It just reminds me of how Naaman, when he was told to go and wash. You remember when he had to dip down in the Jordan seven times and his leprosy would be healed? Well, he thought, why I got to go to this river? <laughs> Isn't there rivers closer by in, 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 in our land that's cleaner? And which is true. If you've ever been to Israel, the Jordan River is not the, <laughs> it's not the cleanest. It's, it probably, I'm not saying it's as dirty as this flood control lagoon out here. But when we went to, to Israel and we went to the Jordan River, one thing I remember about it, first it was cold because we were there in the winter. And some people wanted to get baptized, asked me if I wanted to get baptized. I said, I've already been baptized. I know, but just to, just to be in the Jordan River and to get baptized in the same river that Jesus is baptizing. I said, no, nah, I'm, I, I don't, I'm good. It's too cold. <laughs> And so then he said, okay, since you're not getting baptized, can you help us with the baptism? <laughs> so instead of just going down real fast, now I had to stay in the river. <laughs> but when you're going down to the Jordan River, it's not that clean. It's kind of like, you know, murky. And then there's all these fish, there's these little fish. And when you step down into the river, they, they nibble on you. It's like... <laughs> And they're not like biting, right? they're just kind of just you're like, and it's super, super cold. And anyway, but Jesus told him to go to the pool of Siloam, and he didn't question it. He just did it. You know, sometimes, there's sometimes when we look at this, this man who was born blind, he was born in a difficult situation, but God used that situation. 
And God told him, Jesus told him to do something that sounded very, very strange. But he just listened to Jesus and he just went ahead and did it. And as a result, we see that he was healed of his blindness. Now, we might think it's really strange to spit on the ground and make clay. But in those days, actually, spittle, and especially the spittle of some distinguished persons, was believed to possess certain curative qualities. So in their, in their culture, now I'm not saying that's why Jesus did it, but in their culture, they believed that when someone did that, it had some healing properties to it. And then also the, um, the, vir the virtue of, of the um, saliva in certain cases of disorders of the eye was well known in, the in Jesus' day to have some healing properties when it, when it came to the eyes. So this was something that they kind of were used to in, in a way. So it, it probably didn't seem as weird to them as it may seem to us. Verse 7, and Jesus said, and said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. Now the water for the pool of Siloam came through Hezekiah's tunnel, which was built in the Old Testament times. And it was called Siloam, which means sent, because the water had been sent through the conduit into the city. And it was from the Siloam stream because it was living water. It was uh, water that was that the poor Siloam was fed from a spring. So it was considered to be living water. It was from the Siloam stream that water was drawn, which was poured out over the great altar during the Feast of Tabernacles, which they just celebrated. Remember the, the priest would go down to the to the poor Siloam. And on each day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would get that golden pitcher, they'd put it in the, the Pool of Siloam, and they'd come up, and they would pour it on the altar. And then they did that every day for, for seven days. And then on the last day of the feast, when all the music stopped, and everyone was silent, and, I mean, it, it, it worked up to a crescendo. Everyone was, music was playing, and the, the, they, were, they were blowing the trumpets, and they were singing, and, and, uh, um, and they were making doors. It was very loud, and then everything stopped, and they got that, that, that picture that they, that they drew from the pool of Siloam and they poured it out every day. But on this particular day, they poured it out and there was no water in it. And that's when Jesus said, anyone that is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. And of course, everyone probably looked up and, said, and thought, who's that crazy person saying that? But little, did, little do they know that he, their prayers were being answered right there in front of them and they didn't even realize it. So the pool of Siloam was very important. So the water that they got from the pool of Siloam, they poured out during the Feast of Tabernacles, which they just celebrated, and which pouring out was regarded by the rabbis as typical of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in those days. And that's, of course, what Jesus said, you know, that he was telling them that who, he that believeth on me that in them will be a, uh, a torrents or rivers of living water. And it says, as John wrote it, he's speaking of the, what, Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that's going to be poured out during the millennial kingdom. We see previews of that during the, uh, the Feast of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit came down upon the believers. So he was to go to the Pool of Siloam. So we see, first we see, the man that was born blind, the method of healing that he made clay. Another thing that he did this on the Sabbath. If you study the life of Jesus, you're going to notice that he's going to do all these healings on the Sabbath. And the Jews did not allow. Now, we know that the Sabbath is to be observed. The Bible says that we're supposed to honor the Sabbath, right? And But really what that means is, when you receive Jesus Christ, you're honoring the Sabbath in the New Testament. So Jesus, he is our rest. The, wor the word Sabbath means rest. That's a theme of the Bible. The seventh day, God rested. Canaan land was a place of rest. And Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? I'll give you rest. He is our Sabbath. So when you receive Jesus, 
You received the Sabbath. You're, you're honoring the Sabbath. He is our rest. Because nowadays with Jesus Christ, when we worship, we don't worship. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go to the temple. It's not about a place. It's not about a procedure. It's about a person, the person of Jesus Christ. So when they receive Jesus Christ, then we are honoring the Sabbath. So Jesus is kind of interesting that he does all these healings on the Sabbath. It wasn't that he was just trying to get them upset, but he's trying to prove a point that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And he is not violating the Sabbath that was prescribed or taught in the Old Testament. You see, the, the, the scribes, they're the ones that would, they would take the, um, the they, would, they would read the Old Testament, and then they would write these, a commentary on it. And that commentary that they, that they wrote was, was uh, the Mishnah. They wrote down commentary, the scribes. And then the Pharisees, what they would do, that they would read that, and then they are the ones that would observe it, and they pride in themselves in keeping the Old Testament law. So the Pharisees always had to figure out how to keep the things that the scribes prescribed in the Mishnah. And sometimes it was very strange, the things they came up with. Now, first of all, you know, if they had to tie a rope to get water on the Sabbath, they couldn't do that because it was a violation of the Sabbath. So what they would do, they would, there was a loophole, as we talked about before, that a woman could tie her girdle. She could tie a knot in her girdle to, so she could be modest. So she was allowed to tie a knot in a girdle. So what they would do if they needed to make a rope, they couldn't use a rope. So they would just tie girdles together so they could get water. So we talked about doing stuff like that. And in fact, the scribes wrote it. So sometimes the scribes would, they would do weird things when they, were, when they were trying to interpret the Old Testament. And so when they were writing things down, one time they wrote some things that, that it was so strict and it had laws concerning using the restroom and they had laws about Jerusalem. And so when they wrote all these things down, it basically came up to where someone could not use the restroom anywhere in Jerusalem. So they knew that there was, because that was the way that the scribes would interpret the, the law. Now, when they talked about the Sabbath, they wrote like 70, there was like pages and pages and volumes and volumes that they wrote that would define what work is. You can't work on the Sabbath. So they would write down what work is. And there were certain like um, how heavy of something you could lift and certain things, how far you could travel and you couldn't go past your house so many feet. So sometimes they'd make different little structures here and there, here and there. And they would know how far they could go. And they'd build a structure there and another structure there and another structure there. So on the day of the Sabbath, they could actually walk kind of far because they had all these houses. Because you could walk so far. But one of the things that they could not do was you could not make clay. <laughs> that was forbidden. Because clay could be used in, uh, it could be used as a building material. So you could not make clay. So here they asked, how did he do this healing? Oh, he made clay. <gasps> That's a violation of the Sabbath. Now, not according to the Old Testament, but according to what? The Mishnah. Also, the Talmud was the oral teaching. So we see the the man who was born blind, we see the method of the healing when he, Jesus made the clay out of the spittle and anoint his eyes with it. He told him to go to the pool of Siloam to wash. He went and he came back seen. Now it took faith for the blind man to do what Jesus said. It took faith. Imagine that. He had to find his way from the temple. If you've ever been to Israel, when you go to the temple and then you go to the pool of Siloam, it's kind of, it's a little bit far. You got to, I mean, I don't know if it's a quarter mile or, I mean, well, maybe not that far. But um, it's, it's a journey. So this blind man had to find his way down to the pool of Siloam and down its steps to the pool itself. He could have thought, oh, this is off. Someone's put spit in my eyes and now they're telling me to go all the way down to the pool of Siloam. He's blind. He's got to feel his way. But nevertheless... 
he did it. He probably thought, what have I to lose? <laughs> this person told me to do it. I'm going to just listen. And he, he goes and does it. And he washes and he comes away seen. He could have thought that this was foolish to walk all the way down to the Pool of Siloam to wash the clay out of his eyes because he could have thought, I can wash anywhere else. But he went and washed in faith and obedience because Jesus told him to do it. And he came back seen. This is the first time in the biblical record a person born blind was healed of their blindness. From Genesis to this book, no prophet, no priest, nor apostle ever gave sight to someone that was born blind. This is the first time that this happened. Now, when something like this happens, you're wondering why. Why did this happen? Do you know why? Because the Old Testament stated that the Messiah would give sight to the blind. Listen to these verses. Psalms 146, verse 8. The Lord, by the way, if you look at Psalms 146, verse 8, and you'll be up in the screen in a second. There it is. You see, Lord, remember what we learned? Capital L-O-R-D, that's what? That's Yahweh. That means Jehovah. Jehovah and Yahweh is the same. It's just that Jehovah has the vowels. And so, the Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. So when it says the Lord openeth the eyes, that the Lord is the one that opens the eyes. Here's someone that's born blind. And who did it? Jesus. Who's supposed to do it? Jehovah. But who did it? So Jesus is Jehovah. Opening the eyes of the blind was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 35 to be a work of the Messiah. Isaiah 35 verse 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And if you look at Isaiah 35, you're going to understand that to be uh, prof prophetic of the coming Messiah. So when you've seen something like this, Someone that was born blind, that they now can see, you know that this is the Messiah. Which is the whole purpose of the book of John. Trying to prove that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That he is the Son of God. And that believing you'll have life through his name. His name is what? Jesus. Which means salvation. So last thing we'll look at, the mystery. So this was kind of mysterious to a lot of people. So you see the man that was born blind. See the method of healing the, the clay. The miracle of sight. That this was a miracle. I mean, this is someone that never was able to see before. And then we see the mystery, verse 8. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was, that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? They said, hey, this guy can see. Isn't this the same guy that was begging? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. <laughs> so this was kind of mysterious because it's not every day that you've seen someone that was begging. Now, the beggars, people knew who the beggars were. Like, there's, uh, um, when I go to the bank, and I go to the bank, you know, kind of often through, you know, several times a week, there's always someone there, the same person, that asks people for money. Now, I, it's a mystery to me, honestly. I honestly don't know why this person never asks me for money. Maybe I look broke. <laughs> the person never asks me for money, not one time. I started to get a little bit offended. Hey, the first time I, when I saw this person, I honestly, when I went to the bank, I was in the bank and I got my dollars ready. You know, I got a few dollars ready. Because I knew they were going to ask me. I was going to say, here, and then give them some dollars in the track, right? And so I come out, 
and a person sees me, turns around, and goes to ask somebody else. <laughs> like, okay. And so I thought, well, I just, you know, maybe they thought that that person, the other person had more money or something. So now it's a thing. And I told Roxanne, I said, I said, Rock, Roxanne, you see that person right there? They're always here. They're always asking for money. But they never ask me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You watch. You go to Bank of Hawaii. You can see the person. You know who I'm talking about. No. Some of you, you know, yeah? You see that? That wahini, she always asks. She, she asks you for money. <laughs> she never, not one time asked me for money. Well, anyway, you watch. I'm going to go this week, and she's going to ask me for money this week. <laughs> and I'm always ready, too. I'm always ready. I got my money and everything. And, and she doesn't ask me for money. I don't know why. So I told Rakhchan, I said, watch. She's not going to ask me. And sure enough, I go down, and she turns the other way, goes somewhere else. I'm like, I said, what is it? What is it that she doesn't, why she doesn't ask me for money? Anyway, but what I'm saying is, you know these people. When you go to Windward, uh, Windward City, if you see the same person, or you go to uh, Kanye Bay, there's this one particular person that actually has gotten money from some of my family members a few times. They got a great story. I'm waiting to meet them because I'm going to tell you, oh, I know your story already. You know, someone's at the airport. <laughs> You know, you guys, everybody, someone's at the airport, you know, they have this whole story, real good at it, you know. Anyway, so people that begged, like this blind man, people knew who this was. They knew who this was. So when now that he's seen, it was mysterious. How can this person who's begging all of these years, now he can see? It's public. Now, the religious leaders are not, it's going to be hard for them to put a spin on this one. But they're going to try. So they said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. Maybe he has like a twin. <laughs> well, we never see him before. Hmm. But then he said, I am he. It is me. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. And they said unto him, Where is he? And he said, I know not. You know, that is what he just gave out his testimony. We as believers, if you are a believer, one thing you do have, you may not be able to quote John 3.16 perfectly. You may not be able to quote too many scriptures. You may not know the Romans road to heaven. You may not know all this. You may not have an outline. I think you should have an outline. You know, have an outline, a simple outline. The bad news, the good news. That's my outline, basically. I mean, you may, you may not even have an outline. You may not really have a, a super good plan on how to witness, although I think we should be prepared. But one thing you should have, and if you are saved, you do have, that is a testimony. Bless you. That's the amen, kind of. You have a testimony. And do you know what? People can argue about your doctrine. You might say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And they might say, no, he's not. I don't believe that. You might say that Jesus Christ created the, the heavens and the earth. He is the creator as it states in John chapter 1. And they might say, no, he is not. You might say, I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. And they might say, no, he's not coming. You guys have been saying that for years. But they cannot argue with your testimony. That is the most powerful weapon aside from the scriptures themselves that you and I have. And in some way... It's so important because nobody can tell you what happened to you. They cannot tell this guy, that didn't happen. And he's going to say, no, it did happen. I just did it. I, used to, I couldn't see before. And he just, he made clay out of his spit. He put it in my eyes, told me to wash. I went and washed, and now I can see. Well, how did that happen? I don't know. Where is he? I don't know. I don't know. Who is he? I don't know much about him. Well, one thing I know. I can see now. <laughs> yeah. 
And that may be all you got. You know, sometimes we think that we can't be a witness. We can be a witness. You can be. Why? Because you have a testimony. You say, um, I don't know what my testimony is. Then you're not saved. <laughs> I don't have a testimony. Can I bar- you cannot borrow anybody's testimony, by the way. <laughs> you got to have your own testimony. <laughs> In fact, your testimony is a test of your own salvation. If you, if you can write out your testimony, or if you try to write out your testimony and you cannot, you're thinking, I don't know what happened. You know what? You need to get saved. Because when you get saved, you're going to have a testimony. You know, sometimes we say, does anybody have any testimonies? I stopped saying that. Now we say praise reports because people would think a testimony is, oh, yeah, I, um, you know, I was sick and now I feel better. That's my testimony. No, that's a praise report. But a testimony, we're talking about salvation testimony, is going to contain, a, it's, going to, it's going to sound something like this. This is how I was. This is what happened to me. This is how I am now. That's your testimony. So, yeah, this is, get it, this, is, this is me. This is my testimony. I was raised up in a family where my father never went to church. My mother made us go to church. And we went to the Catholic church. And we went to the Catholic church. I can remember as a child going there all the time. I went to catechism. I went to communion. I took my first communion. I did all this kind of stuff. And you know what? I never did really know what it was about. I didn't know what the Old Testament was and what the New Testament was. I thought that the New Testament was just basically they redid the Old Testament. Like you had to redo it or something. They had to to rewrite it. (laughs) I didn't know there was a difference. And, um, And I remember asking a question to a nun one time. Like, how do we know that we're going to heaven? And she said, this is what she told me. I'm not saying this is Catholic doctrine, but this is what she told me. You know, I'm a child, so she's going to make it simple. She says, okay, when you stand before God after you die, you stand before God, and God is going to put all your good works on one side and all your bad works on the other side. And if you do more good works than bad works, you go to heaven. If you do more bad works, then, then you go to hell. I was like, and I thought, I'm not saying this is Catholic doctrine, which it's kind of not, but in a sense, she really simplified it. But I thought to myself as a kid, well, how do I know where I stand right now? (laughs) Like, how many more good work? I mean, right now I get more good works than bad works or what? You know, how do you know? I wish there was like a way to, you know, kind of where I'm going to stand. It doesn't have nothing to do with that. Of course, I found that out later. And um, I also wanted to know, (laughs) you can think I'm dumb, but I thought, (laughs) you know, it's Easter, right? And we celebrate the resurrection. And you remember this church on the hill over here that that used to be like a Catholic church. I mean, I know it's a place where they have funerals, but before it had, um, Our Lady of Mount Carmel was so packed and um, St. Anne's was so packed before when they, they used to have the older building. We always used to be outside. We kind of liked that, though. We couldn't get in. There was no room, so we stayed outside, and we, we, we'd talk story as us kids. We liked being outside. Or we'd try to go use the restroom, and we never came back. come back. We tried to. We tried to stay out the whole time. But when, some people do that here. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I used to think that every, because I knew that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And on Easter, we celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection. And, you know, I, but I just kind of, I actually thought, you know, that, that, that um, church over there, before they had the church, if you remember a long, long time ago, they didn't have the building. They only had the cross. You remember that? Anybody remembers that? There was just a cross in the cemetery. It was a big cross. The cross on the roof was the same like that. It was a big cross. I thought that every Easter, Jesus came and died on that cross. That one. (laughs) And he died and he was buried and he rose again. I I really thought that. (laughs) And I think I thought that because my cousin told me that or I misinterpreted or something. So I didn't really know. I was young, but I didn't really know. And so then I remember wondering, okay, Jesus died on the cross, but what does that do for me? So I had all these questions, and I was never able to get an answer that satisfied me until I was in high school. And when I was in high school, someone, it was the power team that came. You guys ever heard of the power team? John Jacobs, the power team. So they came, and they were doing all these, all this strength, these feats of strength. And I was getting into lifting weights, and so I was interested in that. And so they came during the day. They had us an assembly, and they did all these things. They ripped phone books and license plates, and they 
Then they were going to have a weightlifting contest at night. I wasn't going to participate, but I wanted to watch. And I went there that night, and after they did all the things, they preached the gospel. And that's the first time I heard it, and I received Jesus Christ that night. And so that's my testimony. And so then after that, I didn't know because I didn't go forward. I didn't want to tell anybody. So there was no follow-up or anything. But later on, I met someone who went to um, a Bible study, and there was a girl I liked that went there, so that's the reason I went. (laughs) And then from there, I got involved with a church. And then from that church, I got involved with another church because my closest friend, Jason, the coach asked him to go, so I said he didn't want to go by himself, and I wanted him to go to a church, so I went with him, and then that's the church that, that I ended up growing in the Lord. In fact, I think I really didn't understand salvation. And when I first thought I got saved, I really wasn't. But when I went to that church, I got saved for real. And then I got baptized, and the Lord called me to preach. That's my testimony. Now, nobody can argue with that. That's what happened to me. And that's kind of simplifying it, but you should be able to have your testimony, be able to give it with just, within a, just a few minutes. And that is one of your greatest evangelistic tools is your testimony because nobody can argue with that they can tell you they don't agree with you they don't believe the bible but they can't tell you what had what has personally happened to you so this man right here he gives his testimony and that's what that's what what he said he says, where is he? He didn't even know where he is. Who is he? I don't know everything about him. I just know that I can see. And that's how it was when I first got saved. I didn't know John 3.16. I didn't know where to find any of the books of the Bible. In fact, when I went to Bible college, I knew I could find Genesis and I could find Revelation. I could probably find some of the Gospels like Matthew, Mark, but it you know, take me a little while. But um, that's it. I went to Bible school. I, I knew hardly anything. But I knew what happened to me. I knew I got saved and I knew the Lord called me to preach. And that's it. And then from there, you grow. And so that's how this person is. He only knows, he says, a man called Jesus. He made clay and out of spit and dirt and told me to go wash it out when he he anointed my eyes with it, and now I see. And they're like, no, that didn't happen. No, that happened. How can you see now? I don't know, but I can see. Now, when um, each and every one of us been through things in our life, some people have been through some horrendous things in their life. Some people have been, been horribly abused in their life. Some people have been brought up in situations that were very, very difficult. And we live in a cursed world. You know, there's just no other way to explain it. But just like this person's difficult situation that Jesus said, that the works of God are going to be revealed. These things have happened to you so that the works of God could be revealed in your life. Who is it, who is it going to be revealed to? Those out there in the world. So when we can think about, man, this happened to me, or I did this in the past. There's sometimes people think that I made bad decisions in the past. You know, I had done these things that I regret and I got involved with this in the past but then you met Jesus then you received Jesus Christ and now you see and now you have a testimony and now there are going to be people that ask you what happened to you and they might not be able to they might not agree with everything about the Bible but they're going to know this one thing we know he can see People out there, I mean, I wonder how many people got saved because they understood that this is, this is the Messiah because he just gave sight to the blind. And when you look at a man like Paul, when you study the life of Paul, who was murdering Christians at one point, then he's planting churches, you know that only Jesus can do that. You know one thing I, I appreciate about our church? When you look around and you might see a rough crowd, you know, you might come to our church and you might, you know, see people that have, uh, uh, by the way, everybody has a past. It's just some, some pasts are more noticeable. But everybody has a past. I mean, we all have, uh, um, they call it a BC days, right? Before Christ. And, but to see the change in the life of some people, to see the dramatic, drastic 
change in life of those that receive Jesus Christ and where they are today. You know, I've seen some that are in Bible college today. I've seen some that are involved with ministry today. I've seen some, and you've seen some too, that God has changed their life dramatically, and they have a testimony because a man named Jesus made clay. And so this guy was born blind. By the way, we are all born sinners. We're born sinners by nature, choice, and practice. We're born with a dead spirit. The Bible says, and you hath he quickened, who were what? Dead in trespasses and sins. This man was born blind, and we are also born spiritually blind. And it wasn't until he met Jesus that Jesus performed a miracle of restoring the sight to someone who's never saw before. And that is a tremendous miracle. But the miracle of someone who was dead in trespasses and sins now being saved is just as much, if not a greater miracle than someone who was blind who can now see. And so now when we met Jesus, we can see spiritually because Jesus is what? He says, I am the light of the world and I've come to give people light. I've come to give people truth. And what did he say in the last chapter? Ye shall know the truth and what? The truth shall make you free, not set you free. It's going to make you free. And there were people that were bound and they were dead in trespasses and sins. But because they've received Jesus Christ, they are now free from sin. And that's basically where we'll stop. So we see the man who was born blind. We see the method of the healing with the clay. And we see the miracle of sight. And then we see the mystery. Now, it was a mystery to a lot of people, but it wasn't a mystery to the man that has, blind, uh, that, that has sight now. And then we'll pick up the, the rest. And we're going to see this, that they're going to um, talk to his parents about it. And his parents are going to be very nervous because they don't want to be excommunicated from the temple. And back then, in those days, that was a very bad thing. And we'll talk about that, what that means. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes?